Hi guys, Terry Gaze here. Quick introduction, if you guys like true crime, horror, and all things unexplained, well, I think you've arrived. Basically, I cover stories like that, and today I have a really interesting one for you, so I hope you are not afraid of clowns. Well, with that short introduction, let's go ahead and get right on into it. When you first look at a clown, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Is it a circus, or maybe a round red nose, or for some, the 1970s? Well, if you have anything in common with 54% of the population, you'd probably think that it's a little unsettling. Calorophobia is the irrational fear of clowns, and unfortunately for this case, it definitely does not help those statistics. Fort Lauderdale, Florida. A city on Florida's southeastern coast, it is home to sandy beaches and watery canals. It is also home to the Strip, a promenade running along Oceanside filled with restaurants, bars, and luxury hotels. However, in the 1990s, the city was just starting to enter its boom phase and truly take off. With the influx of transient activity, both for tourism and otherwise, there was also a noticeable uptick in crime in the very same year. On the morning of May 26, 1990, all seemed well. The weather was beginning to cool down for an impending thunderstorm that was coming later that evening, giving a short respite for the arrival of the scorching sun that will blanket most of Florida in the coming months. With summer at arm's reach, more windows became unlocked and patios open wide just to invite that cool breeze in. This was the very same case as then 21-year-old Joe Ahrens, his three friends, and his mother Marlene Warren were enjoying breakfast together. Between the five of them and Joe's broken leg, they had plenty to banter about. In fact, the only thing that wasn't talked about was a bitter rumor that was lingering in the air. A rumor we'll touch base on later. Just then, there was a knock at the door. Maybe another one of Joe's friends was at the door. Or maybe the newspaper was running late and this was a rushed delivery to make up for lost time. Marlene hopped to her feet as she saw who was at the door, exclaiming, Oh, how sweet, as she headed over to the threshold. Joe, with his injury, was not expected to answer the door. Excited, Marlene opened the door wide, and when she did, she was greeted with a rather unique smile. Red from cheek to cheek, hair as orange as any tangerine, a colorful visage to behold, all held together with three oversized buttons. White gloves holding two gifts, in the right extended two balloons, the silver one proclaiming you're the greatest, and the left hand, flower. Surely a get well soon gift had arrived for Joe. Just as his mom accepted these gifts and unbeknownst to Marlene, the figure in the doorway had a third gift. Just then, Joe looked over and saw the white gloves and the solid black boots. In fact, it was the only solid color in this bright ensemble that stood before his mother. Strangely still, there was a ringing in his ears. As he looked closer and upon second glance, he noticed that his mother had fallen slumped to the ground. Odd, he thought, before coming to the realization to what had just happened. His ears were ringing, his mother had fallen to the ground. A gunshot had rung out. Heroically, and even with his injuries, he sprang into action. Shell casing beside her and looking down the driveway, that thing in the doorway casually enters a white Chrysler LeBaron with no license plate and drives off. Joe, experiencing anything but casual, holding on to his mother, he looks down, noticing she suffered a wound to her face and is beginning to aspirate, struggling to breathe. I, I seriously can't imagine what was going through his mind during this time. In fact, it's amazing to me that he had the courage to gather himself and, and get to the phone during all this chaos in a timely manner, and then describe what he had saw, the, the cold brown eyes behind the makeup. Sadly, the victim Marlene Warren succumbed to her injuries a few days later in a hospital. Michael Warren, Joe's father, was notified as soon as possible returning from a repossession that was normally covered by his co-worker Sheila Keen. Michael owned a used car dealership, and it was pretty successful. In addition, he had his hand in real estate, totaling to over a million dollars in properties. Both Michael and Marlene owned the business. Michael as the face, and Marlene managed it from behind the scenes. A day seemingly going from bad to worse, as a car was also stolen from his lot earlier that day. Later that month, after searching top to bottom, the police found an abandoned LeBaron in the Palm Beach, Florida area, matching the description given to them by Joe. After seizing the vehicle, they found a trace DNA. 
At the time, it was still a new and evolving form of gathering evidence. In addition, the balloons were found out to be purchased from a Publix, as one of the balloons depicted Snow White, and it was the only Publix in the area that had that style of balloon. Unfortunately, the weapon in the clown outfit was never found. Even darker still, this case would remain dormant for 23 years. But that's not the end of our story. As you see, fortune would favor DNA advancements, and this would come through in a way more important than ever. The case was opened in 2013, as it was discovered that Michael wedded anew. Now, that's normally not cause for concern, however, he specifically married Sheila Keen, the one who worked for him during the time of the murder. Now, this is significant because Sheila Keen was actually a suspect from the very beginning. You see, a few rumors were going around at the time. One was that Michael was having an affair with Sheila that she adamantly denied during this entire process. But another rumor was that Michael wanted to get rid of Marlene. Now, admittedly, that one was never proven to be true, but it was very interesting that now they are together after the tragic incident. So, the police followed up. Under further investigation, more holes to the story was filled in one by one. The balloons, the denial of a relationship that was clearly going on during the time of the murder, a previously overlooked orange synthetic fiber recovered from the car that matched Joe's description and that of a wig from a costume, and a possible car missing from the lot. Could this have been the white Chrysler LeBaron? I guess that would explain why there was no license plate on the car. In 2017, Sheila Keen was arrested and charged with first degree murder. She pleaded not guilty and the trial was delayed and set to begin early 2020. But plagued with COVID-19, the trial was pushed out till 2023. During that time, she adamantly claimed to not be guilty until the trial was more imminent. Then she unexpectedly changed her mind to a guilty plea. An inmate had come forward and explained how she bragged about the killings in 1990. This affected her chances at a trial. Sadly, she will probably only see a fraction of her sentence as she already spent five years waiting in jail because of all the delays. In addition, during that time, she was on good behavior. Michael claims that his wife Sheila has nothing to do with the murders, and to this day, he has not been charged or linked to anything involving this case. I hope you guys enjoyed that story as much as I did researching it. The more I peeled it back, it just had layer after layer, and it was really fun to sink my teeth into. However, if you could hold down that subscribe button before it gets away, because once it does, it likes to fill rooms up with passive aggressive post-it notes, and I'm living that nightmare right now. Just so you know, I hope you be true to everyone else, and most importantly, be true to yourself. Bye.